The upscale indoor swimming pool of the Shoreline Sports Complex sparkled under the high skylights, casting a soothing, welcoming glow across the water's surface. It was a weekday afternoon, and the pool was filled with the low, echoing hum of laughter, splashes and murmured conversations. This sports complex prided itself on its reputation, catering mostly to affluent clientele, with strict rules and an air of exclusivity. Today, however, there was a new face among the regular patrons. A ten-year-old black girl named Amara was carefully navigating the pool's shallows, dipping her toes into the water before stepping in with a playful splash. Her father, Mark, a respected civil rights attorney known for his high-profile cases, watched her from one of the nearby lounge chairs. Tall, dressed in casual attire but with an aura of professionalism, he drew the attention of a few passing patrons who seemed curious, even slightly wary, about the new visitors. Mark noticed the glances but didn't react he had become used to such stares. His focus was on Amara who, despite being in an unfamiliar place, looked joyful and excited to spend time with her dad. Mark had chosen this sports complex based on a colleague's recommendation. After weeks of intense work on a high-stakes case, he wanted a relaxing afternoon with his daughter. Though he was aware of the exclusivity of the complex, he hoped it would be a comfortable experience for both of them. Amara had been learning to swim, and this would be a good opportunity for her to practice in a safe, controlled environment. A few minutes into their arrival, Mark noticed one of the lifeguards watching them intently. The lifeguard, a man in his early thirties named Jake, had been scanning the pool when his gaze landed on Amara. Jake's expression subtly shifted to one of mild irritation, as if her presence somehow disrupted the order of his pool. He was a tall, muscular man with a typically professional demeanor, but there was an edge to his gaze that didn't sit well with Mark. Jake, who had worked at Shoreline for several years, was known among the staff for his strictness and unwavering adherence to pool etiquette. He prided himself on maintaining order and ensuring that the pool remained an exclusive, well-regulated environment. Despite his professional exterior, he carried a degree of unspoken prejudice that sometimes showed through in subtle ways. He had grown comfortable with a specific type of clientele, and anyone who didn't fit that profile immediately caught his eye. As Mark settled into his chair, he continued to observe the pool, occasionally glancing at Jake. He noticed the lifeguard's lingering gaze and the subtle, but unmistakable, narrowing of his eyes each time he looked at Amara. Mark felt a twinge of unease but decided not to dwell on it. He reminded himself that they had every right to be there, just like anyone else. Still, he couldn't shake the sense that they were being watched more closely than the other families. Amara, oblivious to the lifeguard's scrutiny, continued to play in the shallow end. She had a gentle, playful nature, and Mark was proud of how independent and resilient she was becoming. He watched her with a warm smile as she practiced her strokes, laughing each time she splashed herself in the face. She was starting to get comfortable in the water, and Mark felt a wave of pride watching his daughter grow in confidence. He called out encouraging words, occasionally giving her tips on improving her technique, and she responded with enthusiastic thumbs-ups. Meanwhile, Jake kept a wary eye on her. In his mind, Amara's presence in the pool was an anomaly something that didn't quite fit his expectations. He found himself questioning whether she knew how to swim properly, assuming without basis that she might cause trouble. To him, she didn't fit the image of the typical shoreline member, and this discrepancy fueled his already biased assumptions. About fifteen minutes later, a commotion erupted on the other side of the pool as a group of teenagers began diving into the water, splashing excessively and laughing loudly. Jake's attention was briefly diverted, and he went over to reprimand them. Amara, meanwhile, took advantage of the relative calm in the shallow end and ventured a little farther out. 
She was cautious, knowing her limits, but her curiosity got the best of her, and she wanted to try practicing in slightly deeper water. Mark noticed her moving farther into the pool and gave her a quick wave, reminding her not to go too far. Amara nodded in acknowledgement, smiling confidently, and took another small step forward. But just as she did, a stronger-than-expected current from the pool's filtration system caught her off guard. The sudden pull startled her, and she lost her balance, swallowing a mouthful of water. She tried to regain control, but the gentle pull had turned into something she hadn't anticipated. In a moment of panic, she tried to call out, but her voice was muffled by the water. Mark's attention shifted immediately when he saw her struggling. He stood up, his heart racing as he took in the sight of his daughter's frantic movements in the water. He looked around for help and locked eyes with Jake, who had just finished scolding the teenagers. Mark raised his arm, signaling to the lifeguard, but Jake barely reacted. He gave a dismissive glance in Amara's direction, apparently assuming that she was simply splashing around or overreacting. His biased judgment clouded his perception, and he didn't see the urgency in her movements. Jake Mark called out, his voice firm and controlled, though tinged with the unmistakable urgency of a father's fear. My daughter, she needs help. Jake glanced over again, a trace of irritation flashing in his eyes. He thought Mark was exaggerating, that he was just an overprotective parent making a fuss. In his mind, the situation didn't warrant immediate action. He gave a slight shrug, as if to say, she'll be fine and resumed his patrol along the pool's edge. Mark's frustration quickly escalated into anger as he realized that the lifeguard wasn't taking the situation seriously. Without wasting another second, he dashed to the edge of the pool, his heart pounding as he watched Amara's head dip below the surface again. He didn't wait for Jake to act his instincts kicked in, and he jumped into the water, swimming toward his daughter with all his strength. As Mark reached her, he pulled her to the surface, helping her catch her breath as she coughed and sputtered. He felt a surge of relief mixed with rage. How could the lifeguard someone whose job was to ensure the safety of every person in the pool have shown such blatant disregard? He held Amara close, whispering words of reassurance as she caught her breath. She looked up at him, her face pale and shaken, and he could feel her heart pounding against his chest. At that moment, Jake finally approached, his expression a mix of annoyance and feigned concern. Is everything all right, he asked in a tone that sounded more like a formality than genuine care. Mark shot him a piercing glare. Where were you, he demanded, his voice low but filled with barely contained fury. You're the lifeguard. You saw her struggling, and you didn't move. Jake shrugged, crossing his arms defensively. She looked fine to me. I thought she was just playing around, and you should have told her not to go that far if she can't swim. Mark's jaw tightened. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. He glanced around and noticed that a few other patrons were watching, some looking uncomfortable, others casting judgmental glances. Mark took a deep breath, trying to steady himself. If you think that's acceptable, you don't belong in this job, he said quietly his words laced with restrained intensity. Jake scoffed, his tone dismissive. Listen, I know what I'm doing. I don't need some overbearing parent telling me how to do my job. Mark's eyes narrowed. He realized that this wasn't just about a single incident, it was about a deeper, more insidious issue. He made a silent vow that this lifeguard's negligence and prejudice would not go unchecked. Holding his daughter close, he began to devise a plan in his mind. The following day, Mark couldn't shake off the memory of the previous afternoon. Amara was fine, recovering well from the incident, but the image of her struggling in the water and the lifeguard's cold indifference haunted him. It wasn't just about one lifeguard ignoring his responsibility, Mark sensed a deeper, 
more systemic issue at play. He knew that if he let this go, Jake's behavior would continue unchecked, possibly putting other families at risk. For Mark, a man whose career revolved around fighting for justice, this was not something he could simply forget. After dropping Amara at school, Mark headed back to the Shoreline Sports Complex. This time, he came prepared. He brought along a trusted friend and colleague, David, an investigative journalist known for his discreet yet impactful reporting. David was intrigued by Mark's story and agreed to help gather evidence. Together, they devised a plan to document the lifeguard's behavior and uncover whether this incident was isolated or part of a broader pattern of negligence and discrimination. Inside the complex, Mark and David made their way to the management office, where they requested a meeting with the facility's director, Mrs. Lambert. She was a woman in her fifties with a polished, corporate demeanor exuding confidence and an air of authority. Mrs. Lambert greeted them with polite professionalism, though her guarded expression hinted that she was already bracing herself for a complaint. Mr. Carter, thank you for coming in. How can we assist you today, she asked, with a practiced smile that didn't reach her eyes. Mark wasted no time. He described the previous day's incident in detail, emphasizing how the lifeguard on duty had failed to respond when his daughter was clearly in distress. He recounted how he had called for help, only to be met with Jake's indifference and dismissive attitude. Mrs. Lambert listened, her expression carefully neutral, but Mark could sense the subtle defensiveness behind her nods. We take safety very seriously here, Mr. Carter, she replied, choosing her words with caution. Our lifeguards are trained professionals, and they follow strict protocols. I'm sure there was simply a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding Mark's voice hardened. My daughter could have drowned. Your lifeguard saw her struggling and chose not to act. This isn't about a misunderstanding, Mrs. Lambert. It's about negligence, and perhaps something even more troubling. Mrs. Lambert's gaze flickered a trace of unease crossing her face. I assure you, we do not tolerate negligence of any kind. We have a protocol for such matters, and I will personally review the incident. Mark held her gaze, refusing to back down. Good, because I plan to do my own review as well. This isn't just about yesterday. I want to know if your facility is upholding its duty to protect all members without prejudice or bias. A strained silence settled over the room. David quietly observed, mentally noting the defensiveness in Mrs. Lambert's response. Mark sensed he wouldn't get much further with her today, but he'd made his point. They left the office with a clear understanding if the complex wasn't willing to take action, he would ensure the truth came out another way. After leaving Mrs. Lambert's office, Mark and David discussed their next steps. David suggested setting up a discreet observation operation. If they could record Jake's behavior during his shifts, they might uncover a pattern. Mark agreed, and they decided to conduct a series of test situations, enlisting the help of friends who would play the role of pool patrons. Over the next few days, they coordinated with a few trusted allies, black and white volunteers of various ages, who agreed to pose as regular pool goers. David arranged small, hidden cameras to capture the lifeguard's interactions and reactions, ensuring they could document any disparities in his response to different people. The first test was simple. David's friend, a young black man named Terence, was to casually approach the pool and pretend to struggle slightly near the edge. Nothing dramatic just enough to see how Jake would respond. When Terence entered the pool area, Jake was already on duty, his usual serious, almost sullen expression in place. Terence stepped into the shallow end, splashing around casually before beginning to act, as if he had lost his balance. Jake's reaction was immediate, but not in the way they'd hoped. He shot Terence a cold, scrutinizing look, his body language tense 
Instead of moving closer to assess whether Terence needed help, he remained at a distance, watching with an expression that bordered on suspicion. After a moment, Jake turned his gaze away, pointedly ignoring Terence's subtle pleas for help. David, watching from a hidden vantage point, noted this carefully. They had expected Jake might be slow to respond, but his complete lack of interest or concern seemed even worse than they'd imagined. Terence eventually left the pool, and Jake barely glanced in his direction as he exited. Mark and David had their first piece of evidence. Encouraged, they moved to the second test. This time, they arranged for Rachel, a white woman in her thirties, to enter the pool and pretend to stumble in a similar way. Almost instantly, Jake's demeanor shifted. As soon as Rachel showed signs of distress, Jake sprang into action, approaching her with concern and offering assistance, asking if she was all right. He even lingered for a few moments after, ensuring she was safe before returning to his station. Mark felt a surge of anger watching the contrast. Here was proof clear, undeniable proof that Jake treated people differently based on their race. It wasn't just negligence, it was selective neglect, a blatant disregard for the safety of those he deemed out of place. The third test was the most significant. Mark and David arranged for a black teenager, Marcus Jr., to simulate a more intense struggle in the deep end. The boy began to splash and wave his arms, appearing genuinely distressed. Jake glanced over, his expression hardening. He hesitated, watching for a few seconds before finally, reluctantly, moving toward the pool. His response was slow, almost as if he resented having to get involved. When Jake reached Marcus Jr., he didn't offer the same care he had shown Rachel. Instead, he barked instructions, his tone harsh and authoritative. Stop splashing around so much. You shouldn't be here if you can't handle the deep end. He snapped, pulling the boy toward the edge with visible irritation. Mark clenched his fists barely containing his rage as he watched from a distance. The evidence was overwhelming. This wasn't just one instance of bad judgment, it was a pattern, a deeply ingrained bias that endangered lives. Mark knew he had more than enough to take action, and he intended to make sure that Jake and the entire Shoreline Sports Complex faced the consequences. Later that evening, Mark and David reviewed the footage together, organizing it meticulously to build a strong case. They discussed potential next steps, weighing the impact of a public complaint versus a private legal action. David, ever the journalist, suggested they leak the footage to create pressure, but Mark wanted a more controlled approach. He didn't want this to become just another headline he wanted lasting change. Let's give Mrs. Lambert one more chance to address this internally, Mark decided. I'll show her the evidence, and if she refuses to act, then we go public. David nodded, respecting Mark's decision. They arranged a follow-up meeting with Mrs. Lambert for the next morning, preparing to confront her with irrefutable proof of Jake's discrimination and negligence. For Mark, this wasn't just about personal justice anymore, it was about protecting others ensuring that no parent would have to watch their child struggle while a lifeguard stood idly by. The next morning, Mark and David returned to Shoreline, bringing with them a flash drive loaded with the damning footage. Mark's resolve was unshakable. He would give the complex a chance to do the right thing, but if they failed, he was ready to expose the truth to the world. Mark entered the Shoreline Sports Complex with David at his side, his jaw set and his eyes steely. Today, he wasn't just a father seeking justice, he was a civil rights lawyer armed with incontrovertible evidence, ready to hold people accountable. The complex, with its glass walls and polished marble floors, radiated the aura of exclusivity, but now it seemed more like a fortress protecting those inside from the consequences of their actions. Mark was here to break through that wall of indifference. As they approached the administrative office, 
Mrs. Lambert looked up, surprised to see them again so soon. She put on her best corporate smile, though there was a glint of apprehension in her eyes. Mr. Carter, she greeted, her voice attempting warmth but failing to hide her unease. I didn't expect to see you back so soon. Is there something else I can help you with? Mark didn't waste time with pleasantries. He placed a small flash drive on her desk, his face devoid of expression. This, he said quietly, is a collection of footage documenting your lifeguard Jake's behavior over the past few days. It shows a clear pattern of discrimination and negligence. I wanted to give you the chance to review it yourself before I take further action. Mrs. Lambert's smile faded, replaced by a look of defensiveness. Mr. Carter, as I mentioned, we take our duties very seriously here at Shoreline. I find it hard to believe that any of our staff would engage in discriminatory behavior. David leaned forward. With all due respect, Mrs. Lambert, the footage speaks for itself. You'll see how differently Jake responded to black and white patrons, ignoring or even scolding those he deemed undesirable, while giving immediate attention and concern to others. Mrs. Lambert's jaw tightened. She hesitated, then picked up the flash drive, inserting it into her computer. As the videos played, her face shifted from mild irritation to shock, and then to discomfort as the evidence became undeniable. The footage showed Jake's indifference to black patrons, his slow, almost reluctant responses, and the dismissive attitude that he displayed toward those he assumed didn't belong. When the last clip ended, Mrs. Lambert looked up, her face pale. I. This is disturbing, Mr. Carter, I'll admit that. But I can assure you that Jake's actions don't represent our values as an institution. We are fully committed to diversity and inclusion. Mark held her gaze, his voice calm but unwavering. Good. Then I expect Shoreline will take immediate disciplinary action. I'm not here to ruin anyone's career, but I need to know that my daughter and others like her will be safe in this pool. Mrs. Lambert hesitated, the gears of corporate damage control turning behind her eyes. She was clearly calculating the potential fallout and weighing it against the cost of firing a long-standing employee like Jake. Of course, we'll investigate further, she said diplomatically. If the evidence supports your claim, we will take appropriate measures. Investigate further, Mark's voice sharpened. You just watch the evidence. What more do you need? But Mrs. Lambert was resolute. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but we have procedures we must follow. I can't simply fire someone without a full internal review. Mark exchanged a look with David, his patience wearing thin. Very well, he said at last, his tone icy. Do your review. But know this, if I don't see meaningful action within a week, I'll be taking this public. The media, social platforms, our legal system, every available avenue. Mrs. Lambert blanched. That won't be necessary, she said quickly. We'll handle this internally. I appreciate your patience and... Commitment to justice, Mr. Carter. Mark nodded curtly. For your sake, I hope you do. As Mark and David left the complex, Mark couldn't help but feel the knot of anger and frustration tightening in his chest. The bureaucracy, the hesitation, it was all so predictable. He had given them evidence, yet they still chose to protect their own. It was a familiar story one he'd encountered countless times in his career. The following day, Mark received an email from Mrs. Lambert's office stating that the complex would be conducting an internal investigation and that he would be informed of the outcome within a week. Mark knew it was a stalling tactic, but he forced himself to wait. He wanted to exhaust every avenue before taking more drastic steps. Three days passed with no word from Shoreline. Meanwhile, Mark couldn't shake the growing sense of urgency. He found himself returning to the complex regularly, not to confront the staff, but to observe. Each time he saw Jake patrolling the pool, he felt a surge of anger.
The man continued his duties as though nothing had happened, his expression unrepentant and self-assured. Mark could tell that Jake was confident he would face no consequences, and that only fueled his determination. Finally, on the seventh day, Mark received a curt email from Mrs. Lambert. She invited him to a conclusive meeting at her office that afternoon. Mark felt a flicker of hope, perhaps. Finally, they were prepared to take responsibility. When he arrived, Mrs. Lambert was waiting, her expression unreadable. Jake was there too, seated across from her, looking vaguely irritated, but not particularly concerned. Mark immediately sensed that something was wrong. Mr. Carter, thank you for coming in, Mrs. Lambert began, her tone unusually formal. We've completed our internal review and have spoken with Jake regarding his conduct. After a thorough examination, we've concluded that while some of his actions may have been misinterpreted, there is no clear evidence of intentional discrimination. Mark's jaw clenched. No evidence. You watched the footage yourself. He treated black patrons with blatant disregard. Mrs. Lambert gave him a tight smile. Mr. Carter, we value your concerns, but we believe that Jake's actions were within the bounds of acceptable conduct. He was following protocol and addressing situations as he saw fit. We've advised him to be more mindful in the future, but we will not be taking disciplinary action. Mark's hands tightened into fists. The rage bubbling inside him was barely containable, but he forced himself to stay calm. So that's it, he asked, his voice low and controlled. You're going to let him keep working here, despite everything. Jake leaned back in his chair, crossing his arms smugly. Look, I didn't do anything wrong, all right? You're just trying to make this a bigger deal than it is. I know how to do my job. Mark looked at him, feeling a mixture of disgust and disbelief. Jake's arrogance was infuriating, but Mrs. Lambert's willingness to defend him was even worse. So, you're saying that my daughter's safety doesn't matter to you, Mark's voice trembled with controlled fury. That you're willing to protect a negligent lifeguard rather than ensure the well-being of every person who comes to this pool. Mrs. Lambert shifted uncomfortably but maintained her corporate calm. Mr. Carter, I assure you, we take the safety of all our patrons very seriously. However, we believe this issue has been addressed appropriately. If you feel dissatisfied with our decision, you are, of course, free to take whatever steps you deem necessary. Mark understood the subtext they were challenging him to back down, counting on the idea that he wouldn't go further. But they didn't know him, not really. They didn't know that he'd spent his life fighting against this exact kind of injustice, against systems that protected the powerful and dismissed the vulnerable. He rose from his chair, his gaze steady. You're going to regret this decision, he said quietly. I gave you the chance to do the right thing, and you chose to ignore it. I won't make that mistake again. Without waiting for a response, he turned and walked out, his mind already racing with plans. If they thought he would back down, they were about to learn just how wrong they were. That evening, Mark sat down with David to review their next steps. The two of them had anticipated that the complex might try to downplay the incident, and now they were prepared to escalate. David had already drafted a preliminary report based on the evidence they'd gathered. The report detailed each instance of negligence, the biased behavior Jake exhibited, and the indifferent response from the complex's management. It was a scathing document, one that laid out the facts with brutal clarity. This is ready to go, David said, his expression grim. We can release it to a few major news outlets and I have some contacts who would jump at the chance to cover this story. Mark nodded, but he hesitated. Part of him wanted to unleash the full force of public scrutiny on Shoreline. He knew the power of the media once this story was out, there would be no going back. But he also knew that going public would expose Amara to potential attention and criticism.
She was a child, and he didn't want her to become a symbol or a talking point in a public debate. Seeing his friend's hesitation, David placed a hand on Mark's shoulder. Look, I know this is hard, but if we don't push, they'll keep brushing this under the rug. You and I both know that these things only change when people are forced to face the consequences. Mark sighed, nodding slowly. You're right. They had their chance, and they chose to protect him. It's time we bring this to light. The next morning, Mark and David began contacting media outlets, sharing the report and the footage they'd gathered. Within hours, the story had started to spread. Journalists called, eager for interviews, and social media buzzed with outrage as people reacted to the footage. The public was horrified by the blatant discrimination and negligence displayed by a lifeguard who was supposed to protect everyone, regardless of their background. As the story gained traction, pressure mounted on Shoreline Sports Complex. People began calling the complex, cancelling memberships and demanding accountability. Local activists rallied around Mark's cause, organising protests outside the facility and calling for reform in the way the complex trained and supervised its staff. Mrs Lambert, who had initially dismissed Mark's concerns, now found herself at the centre of a storm she couldn't control. Every decision she'd made to protect Jake was now backfiring spectacularly, as her reputation and the reputation of Shoreline crumbled under the weight of public condemnation. Meanwhile, Jake's arrogance quickly turned to panic. He hadn't expected the situation to escalate this way. Suddenly, he was facing not just the loss of his job, but also widespread criticism and potential legal action. He tried to justify his actions, claiming he'd only followed protocol, but the public wasn't interested in his excuses. As the fallout continued, Mark watched from a distance, his heart heavy but resolute. He hadn't wanted it to come to this, hadn't wanted to expose his family to such a high-profile controversy, but he also knew that he had done what was necessary, what was right. He had fought to protect his daughter and others like her, to ensure that the systems meant to safeguard lives didn't become instruments of discrimination. For Mark, this was more than just a victory, it was a lesson. A reminder that justice was not something to be given or taken away on a whim, but something that must be demanded, fought for, and upheld. As the story of Shoreline's negligence spread, the pressure on the complex grew with every passing hour. The scandal reached the desks of journalists, social justice advocates, and even local politicians who recognized the need for accountability. News outlets covered the incident, with headlines like Elitist Sports Complex Ignores Black Child Safety and Racial Discrimination at Shoreline Pool Father Fights Back. The story resonated with readers who were outraged by the systemic bias and negligence in a place that prided itself on exclusivity and prestige. Mark was both satisfied and exhausted. He had expected pushback, but he hadn't anticipated the level of support he'd received from the community. People from all walks of life reached out, sharing similar experiences or simply offering words of encouragement. Some families who frequented Shoreline cancelled their memberships in solidarity, unwilling to support a business that prioritised image over safety. The ripple effect was undeniable, and Shoreline was reeling. In response to the public outrage, Shoreline's management finally decided to take action, or at least, to appear as if they were doing so. Mrs Lambert released a statement to the press, carefully crafted to appease both patrons and critics. She expressed regret over the misunderstanding and promised a full review of policies to ensure every guest's safety and dignity. It was a polished attempt at damage control, but Mark and his allies saw it for what it was a hollow gesture meant to placate the public without addressing the root problem. The next day, Mark received an unexpected call from Mrs. Lambert, requesting a private meeting. Her tone was markedly different, more conciliatory, almost pleading. Mark was skeptical but agreed to meet.
seeing an opportunity to push for real change. When he arrived at Shoreline, Mrs. Lambert greeted him with a strained smile. She led him to a conference room where two other members of the complex's board were waiting, their expressions tense and guarded. They introduced themselves Mr. Harrington, a senior board member, and M.S. You, the complex's legal advisor. Both looked uncomfortable, clearly aware of the scrutiny they were under. Mr. Carter, thank you for coming in, Mrs. Lambert began, her voice carefully measured. We realize that the events of the past week have been challenging, both for you and for us. We want to resolve this in a way that benefits everyone. Mark raised an eyebrow, folding his arms across his chest. I'm listening. Mrs. Lambert exchanged a quick glance with Mr. Harrington, then continued. We've decided to conduct a formal investigation into Jake's behavior, and we're willing to implement additional training on sensitivity and anti-bias for all our staff. Mark studied her, sensing the carefully chosen words. Formal investigation. Additional training, he shook his head. This isn't about a single training session. It's about a systemic problem. Your lifeguard was willing to put a child's life at risk because of his biases. That's not something a few training videos will fix. MS. You, the legal advisor, leaned forward, attempting to mediate. Mr. Carter, we understand your concerns. We're open to discussing policy changes, but please understand, as a private facility, we have certain operational standards that must be balanced. Balanced Mark's voice was incredulous. There's nothing to balance when it comes to a child's life. If Jake had followed the standards you're referring to, my daughter wouldn't have been ignored when she needed help. Mr. Harrington cleared his throat, shifting uncomfortably. We, we want to make things right, Mr. Carter. Perhaps we could come to an agreement, a settlement of sorts. A gesture of good faith to demonstrate our commitment to resolving this matter fairly. And Mark's eyes narrowed. A settlement. Mrs. Lambert nodded, clasping her hands together. We would provide a financial compensation package, as well as a public statement acknowledging our commitment to improving our standards. We hope this can bring closure to everyone involved. Mark felt a surge of anger rising within him. He had seen this tactic before institutions offering money in exchange for silence, hoping to sweep their failings under the rug. He looked around the table, meeting each board member's gaze in turn. Their discomfort was palpable they wanted this problem to go away with as little impact on their reputation as possible. Let me make this clear, Mark said, his voice cold. I'm not here for a payout. My daughter's life isn't something you can settle with money. What I want is a commitment to real change and overhaul of your policies, a review of your hiring practices, and an accountability structure that ensures incidents like this never happen again. If you're not willing to do that, then this conversation is over. Mrs. Lambert's face tightened. She had underestimated Mark's resolve and now she was facing a man who would not be swayed by financial incentives. She glanced at Mr. Harrington and M.S. You, both of whom looked increasingly uneasy. Finally, she nodded. All right, Mr. Carter, we're prepared to consider these measures, but we'd need some time to review and implement these changes. This isn't something we can do overnight. Mark leaned forward, his gaze unyielding. Then start today. And while you're at it, I suggest you suspend Jake from his position until the investigation is complete. Continuing to let him work here, knowing what he's done, sends a clear message about where your priorities lie. The board members exchanged nervous glances, weighing the potential backlash. After a long pause, Mrs. Lambert nodded reluctantly. Fine. We'll suspend him with pay while we conduct the investigation. It wasn't a complete victory, but it was a step forward. Mark stood up, gathering his things. I'll be watching closely, Mrs. Lambert. If I see even a hint of inaction, I'll take this to the next level. And believe me, 
the public is watching too. As he left the complex, Mark felt a surge of determination. He knew that Shoreline's management was making these concessions not out of genuine remorse, but because they were cornered. He would hold them to their promises, ensuring that this wasn't just another empty PR gesture. Over the next few days, news of Shoreline's response circulated through social media and news outlets, fueling further public debate. Supporters of Mark's cause called for greater accountability across the board, while critics argued that the situation was being blown out of proportion. Mark tried to ignore the detractors, focusing instead on the impact his actions were having. The complex announced Jake's suspension, though they avoided mentioning the reason publicly. Instead, they framed it as part of an ongoing review of operational procedures. Despite Shoreline's attempts to downplay the situation, the suspension sent a clear message. For the first time, Mark felt that real change might be possible. Then, unexpectedly, Mark received a phone call from an unknown number late one evening. He hesitated before answering, unsure of who might be calling, but curiosity got the better of him. Mr. Carter, the voice on the other end, was low and hesitant. This is Jake. Mark's mind raced, caught off guard. Jake, what do you want? There was a pause. Then Jake spoke, his tone subdued. Look, I know I'm probably the last person you want to hear from. But I, I needed to talk to you. Mark's initial instinct was to hang up. He had no desire to listen to Jake's justifications or excuses, but something in the lifeguard's voice gave him pause. There was no hint of the arrogance he'd displayed before, only uncertainty and something that almost sounded like regret. What do you have to say? Jake Mark asked, his tone cold but curious. Jake hesitated. I know what I did was wrong. At the time, I didn't. I didn't see it that way. But after everything that's happened, I've had time to think, and... I'm sorry, I messed up. I shouldn't have ignored your daughter like that. Mark was silent, his emotions conflicted. Part of him wanted to dismiss Jake's apology as too little, too late. But another part of him recognized the significance of a man like Jake, even if it was out of self-preservation acknowledging his mistakes. Why now, Mark asked, his voice carefully controlled. Why are you apologizing now when the whole world is watching? Is this about protecting your job? Jake's voice wavered. No, it's not about the job. I've been thinking a lot about why I acted the way I did. And I realize it was wrong. I didn't treat her fairly. I know that now. Mark could hear the sincerity or desperation in Jake's voice, and he was torn. Was this genuine remorse? or a man grasping at straws to save himself. Either way, it was clear that Jake was struggling with his own guilt and fear. Jake, my daughter could have drowned, Mark said, his voice firm but not unkind. I trusted this place to keep her safe, and you betrayed that trust. Apologies are just words. I need to see real change. I understand, Jake replied, sounding almost defeated. If... If there's anything I can do to make it right, I want to try. Mark considered this, feeling the weight of his responsibility, not just as a father, but as someone who had the power to demand accountability. If you're serious, then work on yourself, Jake. This isn't just about one incident, it's about making sure you don't carry those biases into your job again. After a long pause, Jake responded, his voice subdued. I will, Mr. Carter. I promise. When Mark hung up, he felt a strange mix of emotions, anger, satisfaction, but also a sliver of hope. Maybe, just maybe, this experience had left an impact on Jake, planting the seeds for genuine change. Mark didn't know if he could forgive him, but he could at least recognize the possibility that something meaningful could come from this. And if not, Mark would be there to ensure that Jake never had the chance to endanger another life again.
The next morning, Mark found himself reflecting on the previous night's conversation with Jake. The lifeguard's apology had left him with mixed feelings. Jake's words seemed sincere, yet Mark couldn't dismiss the possibility that fear and self-interest, rather than genuine remorse, had driven the call. But Mark also understood that true change rarely happened overnight. It took commitment, accountability, and sometimes a push in the right direction. He knew that Jake, and Shoreline itself, needed more than just the threat of public backlash. They needed a fundamental shift in perspective and policy. Determined to keep the pressure on, Mark met with David to discuss their next move. They both agreed that while the public exposure had been effective, the fight was far from over. Mrs. Lambert's promises to conduct an investigation were a step forward, but Mark knew she was likely doing the bare minimum to protect Shoreline's image. It was time to raise the stakes. David Mark began, his voice resolute, I want to push for a deeper investigation. Not just into Jake, but into Shoreline's entire approach to safety and diversity. This isn't just about one lifeguard, it's about a culture that allows people like him to operate unchecked. David nodded, already scribbling down ideas. We can start by looking into Shoreline's hiring practices, training programs, and past incidents. If there's a pattern of negligence or discrimination, we'll find it. They decided to reach out to former employees and patrons who might have insight into Shoreline's operations. Over the next few days, David's network of journalists and investigators dug into the complex's history. Soon, the information they uncovered began to paint a troubling picture. Several former employees described Shoreline as an exclusive old boys club where certain staff members felt protected, regardless of their conduct. Complaints of racial insensitivity and favoritism had surfaced before, but they were often dismissed or quietly swept under the rug. A former lifeguard shared stories of Jake's unprofessional behavior, mentioning that he'd been reported for his dismissive attitude toward certain patrons, yet he remained employed. Another staff member revealed that Jake had once been warned about his lack of responsiveness. During an emergency drill, but management chose to overlook it, chalking it up to a misunderstanding. As the investigation progressed, Mark and David realized they were uncovering a culture of indifference and prejudice embedded within Shoreline. Armed with this new information, Mark felt a renewed sense of urgency to bring it all to light. One afternoon, Mrs. Lambert called Mark unexpectedly, her voice tense and controlled. Mr. Carter, we've received some rather. Concerning inquiries from the press, I'd like to invite you back to the complex for a meeting to discuss a resolution. Mark recognized the subtle panic in her voice. Shoreline was under siege, and the pressure was finally breaking through their polished veneer of control. He agreed to the meeting, knowing it was likely another attempt at damage control but he also saw it as an opportunity to press for real change. When he arrived at the complex, Mrs. Lambert was waiting, flanked by Mr. Harrington and M.S. You, the legal advisor from their previous meeting. The atmosphere in the room was tense, the weight of recent developments evident on their faces. Mrs. Lambert gestured for him to sit, her hands clasped tightly together as she chose her words carefully. Mr. Carter, she began, it's clear that the situation has escalated beyond what any of us anticipated. We want to resolve this matter swiftly and decisively, both for Shoreline's sake and for yours. In Mark raised an eyebrow, his tone even but unwavering. I'm here to discuss solutions, not settlements. Let's skip the usual formalities. Mrs. Lambert's expression tightened, but she nodded. Very well. We've reviewed the footage and the complaints you've raised. We recognize that there have been lapses in judgment and professionalism on Jake's part, and we're prepared to make changes to ensure this never happens again. She gestured to Mr. Harrington, who spoke up, his voice calm but strained.
We're willing to implement a series of measures to address the concerns you've brought to our attention. This includes mandatory diversity and sensitivity training for all staff members, as well as a revised protocol for handling emergencies and complaints. Mark listened carefully, though he noted that their offer sounded rehearsed, as if it were crafted by public relations consultants rather than stemming from genuine accountability. That's a start, he replied, his gaze steady. But it's not enough. I want transparency and accountability. That means regular audits, an independent oversight committee, and clear consequences for any further breaches of policy. Mrs. Lambert's lips thinned, but she nodded. We're open to discussing those possibilities. Mark leaned forward, his eyes narrowing. And what about Jake? There was a brief silence, and then M.S. You cleared her throat, her gaze shifting uncomfortably. We're prepared to terminate Jake's employment if that's what it takes to resolve this situation amicably. Mark held her gaze, his expression impassive. This isn't about one person. Firing Jake is only part of the solution. I want to make sure this institution undergoes real change. Otherwise, this cycle will continue, with or without him. The board members looked at each other, clearly uncomfortable with Mark's uncompromising stance. But they knew he wasn't bluffing. The weight of public scrutiny and the potential for legal repercussions left them with little room to maneuver. Finally, Mrs. Lambert spoke again, her voice subdued. We'll work with you, Mr. Carter. We're committed to implementing the changes you've outlined. It's in everyone's best interest to ensure that Shoreline becomes a safer, more inclusive environment. Mark nodded, but his expression remained resolute. I'll hold you to that. I expect concrete results, not empty promises. And if I don't see meaningful progress, I won't hesitate to escalate further. As the meeting concluded, Mark felt a sense of accomplishment, tempered by a lingering wariness. He had pushed Shoreline's management as far as he could, but only time would reveal whether they would follow through on their commitments. In the days that followed, Shoreline began rolling out the promised changes. They issued a public statement announcing a comprehensive overhaul of their policies, including the implementation of an independent oversight committee and regular diversity training for all staff. Jake's termination was quietly confirmed, though Shoreline carefully avoided framing it as an admission of guilt. As these changes unfolded, Mark received an outpouring of support from the community. Families who had experienced similar treatment at Shoreline shared their stories, grateful that someone had finally taken a stand. The public's response reaffirmed Mark's resolve, validating his decision to fight for systemic change. But just as Mark was beginning to feel a sense of closure, he received an unexpected message from an anonymous source. It was a simple, cryptic email that read, There's more to Shoreline than you realize. If you're serious about change, look deeper. The email piqued Mark's curiosity. He shared it with David, who immediately suggested investigating further. Together, they began combing through Shoreline's history, looking for patterns or clues that might reveal additional layers to the complex's operations. What they discovered was both shocking and disturbing. It turned out that Shoreline's board members had connections to several influential figures in the community, including politicians and local business moguls. This web of connections had allowed the complex to operate with minimal oversight, shielding them from scrutiny and enabling them to cover up incidents that would have damaged their reputation. One of David's contacts, a former employee of Shoreline, provided a critical piece of information. He revealed that years ago, a similar incident involving racial discrimination had occurred at the complex. A black family had been harassed by staff, and when they complained, their membership was revoked and the issue was quickly buried. This incident had never reached the public eye, thanks to Shoreline's powerful connections and their ability to silence dissent. Mark's anger reignited, 
as he pieced together the extent of Shoreline's complicity. This wasn't just an isolated issue with one lifeguard, it was a pattern of discrimination and corruption that had been allowed to fester for years. He realized that his fight was far from over, if anything, it had only just begun. Mark and David knew that exposing these deeper connections would be a formidable task. Shoreline's network of influence ran deep, and they would face resistance at every turn. But Mark was undeterred. Armed with the truth, he was more determined than ever to dismantle the systems that allowed places like Shoreline to operate without accountability. Over the following weeks, Mark and David worked tirelessly, gathering evidence and building a case against Shoreline. They reached out to community leaders, local activists, and legal experts, forming a coalition dedicated to exposing the complex's corruption and ensuring that lasting change would be achieved. As word of their investigation spread, Shoreline's board members began to panic. The pressure on them was mounting, and their carefully constructed image was crumbling. They attempted to discredit Mark, painting him as a troublemaker who was determined to tarnish Shoreline's reputation. But the public wasn't swayed. People had seen the footage, heard the testimonies, and witnessed Shoreline's evasive tactics. Mark's credibility remained intact, and his supporters rallied around him, refusing to be silenced. Finally, after weeks of relentless work, Mark and his coalition filed a formal complaint with the local government, demanding a full investigation into Shoreline's practices. The complaint included testimonies from former employees, documented incidents of discrimination, and evidence of the complex's attempts to cover up wrongdoing. The investigation gained momentum, attracting media attention and sparking a public outcry. Local politicians, Recognizing the impact of the case, pledged to support the investigation, vowing to hold Shoreline accountable and to push for broader reforms in the way private facilities operated. The community had spoken, and their voices could no longer be ignored. As Shoreline's board faced mounting pressure, they realized that their only option was to cooperate fully. They issued a public apology acknowledging the need for change and committing to transparency. Under intense scrutiny, they began implementing Mark's demands, transforming Shoreline into a facility that prioritized safety, inclusivity, and accountability. For Mark, the victory was bittersweet. He had fought tirelessly, not just for his daughter, but for every person who had been wronged by Shoreline's indifference. And though the journey had been grueling, he knew it was worth it. This battle had led to real, meaningful change, a legacy that would protect future generations and hold those in power accountable. Mark walked away from the fight with a sense of pride and resolve, knowing that his actions had made a difference. And as he looked at his daughter, safe and smiling, he felt a profound gratitude for the strength that had carried him through. He had stood up to injustice, and he had won proving that one voice, armed with truth, could indeed bring about change. As the formal investigation into Shoreline Sports Complex progressed, public pressure intensified, drawing the eyes of both local and national media. Shoreline's board members found themselves under constant scrutiny, their carefully curated image unraveling as each new piece of evidence surfaced. Mark watched as the complex's defences, which had once seemed impenetrable, began to crack. One morning, Mark received a call from the lead investigator, notifying him that they had uncovered evidence of further discriminatory practices at Shoreline, along with records showing that complaints from patrons and employees had been routinely ignored or minimised. The investigator explained that the board had deliberately suppressed multiple complaints, many of them involving Jake and other staff members who had shown similar prejudices. Shoreline's management had knowingly allowed this behavior to continue to protect their reputation and bottom line. The news was a turning point. Armed with this information, Mark organized a press conference to bring the findings into the public eye.
The room was packed with reporters, activists, and community members, all eager to hear the latest developments in the case. Mark stood at the podium, his expression resolute yet composed. As he looked out over the crowd, he felt the weight of the moment, aware that his words could shape the future of accountability for institutions like Shoreline. Today. Today. He began, his voice steady, we stand at a crossroads. Shoreline Sports Complex, a place that promotes itself as a sanctuary of health and safety, has failed in its most basic duty, to protect and serve every individual who walks through its doors. This investigation has revealed a pattern of negligence, bias and corruption at the highest levels of its management. Mark shared the investigators' findings, explaining how complaints had been systematically buried and how Jake's repeated infractions had been dismissed. He described the culture of impunity that permeated Shoreline, a place where certain individuals felt entitled to treat others as lesser simply because they didn't fit a certain profile. As a community, we cannot accept this, Mark continued, his voice growing more passionate. The safety of our loved ones cannot be compromised. No one should ever have to question whether they'll be protected based on the color of their skin. Shoreline's failure is a failure that we, as a society, must confront head on. And I won't rest until every person responsible is held accountable. The press conference sent shockwaves through the community. News outlets replayed Mark's words and social media buzzed with calls for justice. Families who had experienced similar discrimination shared their own stories, adding to the mounting pressure on Shoreline's management to implement meaningful reform. Faced with overwhelming evidence and public condemnation, Shoreline's board finally conceded. They issued a statement admitting their failures, vowing to overhaul their policies and commit to a zero-tolerance policy on discrimination. More than that, they announced that they would be establishing an independent oversight committee, which would include community leaders, civil rights advocates, and safety experts to monitor staff conduct and hold management accountable. Mark watched the announcement with a sense of accomplishment knowing that this outcome wouldn't have been possible without the combined efforts of everyone who had spoken out and stood by him. But as much as he wanted to savor the victory, he couldn't shake the thought of Jake, the lifeguard whose negligence had set this entire chain of events in motion. A few days later, Mark received an unexpected letter. It was from Jake. Skeptical but curious, Mark opened it expecting yet another half-hearted apology. Instead, the letter revealed a different side of the man he had come to despise. In the letter, Jake expressed deep regret, not only for what he had done to Amara but for the mindset that had allowed him to act so callously. He explained that he had grown up surrounded by certain prejudices that he had never questioned until now. The media coverage and investigation had forced him to confront the harm his actions had caused, not just to Amara but to many others who had come before her. I don't expect forgiveness, Jake wrote. But I do want you to know that I'm committed to changing. I've signed up for a program to help me understand and overcome my biases. And while it may not mean much now, I wanted you to know that your fight made a difference, not just for the community, but for me as a person. Mark read the letter in silence, his emotions a complicated blend of satisfaction, relief, and lingering anger. He didn't know if he could ever forgive Jake, but he did recognize the significance of someone acknowledging their wrongdoing and actively working to change. In a strange way, it felt like a small but meaningful victory. Days after receiving Jake's letter, Mark stood before Shoreline's new oversight committee to present a series of recommendations aimed at preventing future incidents. He suggested mandatory anti-discrimination training for all staff, the implementation of an anonymous reporting system for both patrons and employees, and regular performance audits to hold lifeguards and other staff accountable. The committee, composed of respected community leaders, nodded in agreement pledging to adopt these measures, 
With each passing day, Shoreline transformed from a symbol of exclusivity and neglect to one of inclusivity and accountability. The reforms Mark had fought for began to take root, reshaping not only Shoreline but setting a new standard for similar facilities in the area. One afternoon, Mark took Amara back to the pool. This time, he felt a sense of calm as he watched her swim, surrounded by lifeguards who were now trained not just in life-saving techniques, but in respect and empathy. Amara waved to him, her smile bright and carefree. For the first time since the incident, Mark felt that she was truly safe. As he left the complex, Mark looked back one last time, feeling the weight of all they had accomplished. This fight had been about more than just one person or one place. It was about justice, integrity, and the right to be treated with dignity. And as he walked away, he knew that their victory would inspire others to stand up and demand the same. Months had passed since Mark's battle with Shoreline Sports Complex, but the impact of his actions continued to ripple through the community. The changes he had fought for were not just in place, they were thriving. Shoreline had embraced the new Policies and Oversight Committee, and the once exclusive club had transformed into a model of inclusivity and accountability, regularly cited in local news as an example of how institutions could evolve when held to a higher standard. Mark's life had settled into a new normal. He still received messages from strangers, families thanking him for making Shoreline a safer place, or people who had been inspired by his story to confront discrimination in their own communities. For Mark, this response was deeply rewarding. He hadn't set out to become a public figure, but knowing that his stand had sparked change for others gave him a profound sense of purpose. One afternoon, while picking Amara up from school, Mark noticed a familiar figure waiting for him in the parking lot. Jake stood there, his expression both nervous and determined. It had been months since they'd last spoken, and though Jake had written that heartfelt letter, they hadn't seen each other in person since the incident. Mark felt a mix of surprise and caution, unsure what this meeting would bring. Mr. Carter Jake began, his voice steady but humble. I don't mean to intrude. I just... I wanted to thank you. For everything. Mark tilted his head, studying him. Thank me. Jake. I'm not sure I understand. Jake looked down, gathering his thoughts, then looked back up with a sincerity that took Mark by surprise. You were right to push for change, even if it meant exposing my mistakes. I joined that program, the one I mentioned in my letter. It's been challenging, but it's opened my eyes to things I'd ignored all my life. I see now that I was wrong, not just with Amara but with how I looked at people. I needed this wake-up call, and I don't think I would have gotten it if you hadn't stood your ground. Mark regarded him for a moment, processing Jake's words. It wasn't an apology he had already received that. This was something deeper, a man facing his past and committing to become better. Mark's resolve softened slightly, and he offered a small nod. Jake, People make mistakes, Mark said quietly. But not everyone is willing to acknowledge them, let alone change. I'm glad you're doing the work. Jake smiled, looking relieved. Thank you, Mr. Carter. I'll keep trying to be better. And I want you to know that I'll carry this lesson forward, both in my work and in my life. With that, Jake offered his hand. Mark paused, then shook it firmly a silent acknowledgement of the transformation that had taken place. It was a rare moment of reconciliation, one that felt honest and final. After Jake left, Mark drove Amara home, feeling an unexpected peace settle over him. This fight had never been about punishing Jake or any one person. It had been about creating a system where everyone, especially people like his daughter, felt safe and respected. Knowing that Jake had taken responsibility for his actions was a powerful testament to the changes they'd accomplished. A few weeks later, 
Shoreline hosted a community event to celebrate its new inclusive policies and the changes made possible by Mark's advocacy. Mark was invited to speak, and as he took the stage, he looked out over a crowd that included not only families and local leaders but Shoreline staff, new and old. Among them, he saw familiar faces, Mrs. Lambert, Mr. Harrington, MSU, all of whom had played roles, whether reluctant or supportive, in bringing about the transformation of the complex. Change isn't easy. Mark began, his voice clear and steady, but it's necessary. I fought this battle not just for my daughter, Amara, but for every child and family who deserves safety, respect and fairness. This journey taught me that even the most established systems can adapt, but it takes commitment and accountability. The crowd applauded, and Mark continued, Shoreline has become a model, not because it was forced to change, but because it chose to embrace that change. This complex is now a place where all families, regardless of background, can feel safe and valued. And I hope that what we've done here inspires others to make their own spaces inclusive and fair. As he finished, the crowd erupted in applause and Mark felt a swell of pride. Looking out, he saw Amara beaming and a sense of closure washed over him. The journey had been painful, but they had emerged stronger and had made a tangible difference. The following week, a letter arrived at Mark's office. It was from the mayor, acknowledging his work and announcing that a new city policy would be implemented based on Shoreline's reforms, extending similar oversight and inclusivity requirements to other recreational facilities across the city. Mark felt a deep satisfaction, knowing that his fight had laid the groundwork for lasting, citywide change. Mark hung the letter in his office, a reminder of the power of persistence, the importance of standing up for what's right, and the profound impact that one voice can have on a community.